Welcome to Blockbuster Video. You're a kid. It's Friday night. You have the whole weekend ahead of you. You've been begging your parents all week and they finally give in. You're allowed to have a sleepover. After ordering a pizza, you and some friends visit the video store on the way to pick it up. You scrounge the aisles, picking up everything that looks enticing to you in some way. Movies you've seen a hundred times, movies you've never heard of, movies that you know you won't be allowed to watch. And then you see this. This cover. It entrances you in a variety of ways. The title reminds you of the Metallica song and you wonder if there's any correlation. There's creepy characters that look vaguely familiar but you don't recognize at all. And then you look to the movie next to it and see the sequel. Then the third. And you realize there seems to be a pile of these movies but you, your friends, nor anybody you know have ever seen them. And that gives you a weird feeling. Maybe this experience isn't so universal, but I know I was constantly perplexed by Puppet Master as a kid. The cover used to scare me when I was really young, and when I was a teenager and into collecting CDs and DVDs, I felt compelled to buy it multiple times just to see what it was all about. However, I quickly learned that Puppet Master is a small but significant portion of a large puzzle that is Full Moon Features. So I figured, considering the time of year, it'd be perfect to talk about this empire of B-movie schlock. See what I did there? Actually, wait, you wouldn't be able to see because I haven't explained it yet. So first, let's talk about... The story of Empire Pictures starts with one man, or rather, one family. That family is the Band family. The founder of Empire was a man by the name of Charles Robert Band. Charles was born in 1951 to French-born American film director Albert Band, whose birth name was Alfredo Ant... Alfredo Antonini. Alfred... <laughs> Albert Band whose birth name was Alfredo Antonini. Albert Band was a notable director and producer and son of Max Band, who was a renowned painter in the early 1900s. So it's safe to say that Charles had artistry in his veins. It's interesting to think that Max Band, a man who attended art school in Berlin in the 1920s and wrote a book called History of Contemporary Art, would have been alive to see Charles' first film, Last Foxtrot in Burbank, a parody of Last Tango in Paris. The juxtaposition of Charles and his grandfather Max Band is kind of a perfect representation of Charles Band in a nutshell. An appreciation for art and creativity, but with an underground DIY attitude lacking any self-seriousness or taste. And this is not a mark against Band. I love this attitude. It's what makes his work uniquely his. This attitude couldn't be more clear in the creation of Empire Pictures, which Band founded in 1983. Empire was founded for what seems to be two major contributing factors. One, after releasing a few films of his own in the 70s, Band decided that he wanted more creative control over his projects. And two, Band saw a gap in the film industry that he felt he could fill, and that was for independent voices in horror, sci-fi, and fantasy genres. It was during this time that Band would begin to cement his reputation with the knack for directing and producing B-movie schlock that I mentioned earlier. Throughout the 80s, Empire would produce a lot of movies, too much to even go over all of them here. However, the most notable ones, for better or for worse, are Ghoulies 1 and 2, Reanimator, Troll, Trancers, Dolls, and Robot Jocks. A lot of these films are cult classics in their own right, and they're remembered today not necessarily for their outstanding effects, stories, or acting, but for their pure outlandishness or entertainment value. And once again, I love stuff like this. I'm just being honest that a lot of these films are remembered for their so bad as good qualities. Regardless of Empire Pictures film quality, they were indeed successful and popular. Popular enough that during this time, Empire was releasing sometimes over 10 movies a year. However, with this popularity came issues that Band did not anticipate. He says in an interview with Influx Magazine, I had a lot of control in the fact that I was greenlighting the movies, and as things got trickier for the way I was set up, the edict was you had to pick up movies from other filmmakers and distribute those and help pay some overhead. We did that, so what started off as a pure blend of movies that I wanted to see made and released became watered down with other people's films. Then eventually, the business changed so radically that it made sense for me to step away, which I did. What Band started as a way to become more involved in the movie making process had become more and more like the big movie corporations that Band started Empire to be different from in the first place. In the late 80s, Empire dramatically increased their production, making even more movies, all while securing multi-million dollar home video deals. In 1988, things would change. As cinema entered a new decade, audience interests, trends, filmmaking techniques, and technology were all changing as well. Movies were becoming more expensive to make. This wouldn't be good news for Empire. As production issues aside, they'd be forced to face a long-standing debt to French bank Credit Lyonnais, a debt which they would not be able to afford. 
In May of 1988, the company would be absorbed by Epic Productions, a company which would later become involved in the Credit Lyonnais Hollywood scandal, and be forced to close only a few years later. Needless to say, many elements of the Hollywood and home video market were in disarray at this time. However, if Band's family had taught him anything, it was that perseverance and artistic and creative endeavors were worth it. And with all this experience now behind him, Band had something else up his sleeve. And now, a box of little toys has become a gang of little terrors. In autumn of 1988, a few months after Empire folded in May, Charles Bam would found his newest endeavor, and he wanted to regain focus to the core tenants that led him to found Empire in the first place. When I started Full Moon, I was hell-bent on not letting that happen again. Now would probably be a good time to bring up the fact that Full Moon has changed its name multiple times throughout its lifespan. The company was founded as Full Moon Productions, upon release of Puppet Master and a few other films, until its change to Full Moon Entertainment in 1990. Six years later, the company would change its name once again to Full Moon Pictures, and then again in 2003 to Full Moon Features, which it's remained as since then. So while all these names can be a little confusing, I mostly refer to it as just Full Moon. Band has spoken in many interviews about his goal of wanting to make projects he's involved with feel like big budget movies even when they're not. He has a passion for practical effects, props, and world building. With all that in mind, about a year later, Full Moon Entertainment will release their first film. The Puppet Master. <laughs> Originally meant for theaters, Band would ultimately decide to corner the directed video market. It's clear in the success of this movie, as well as Band's eventual empire, that this was a good move. Puppet Master quickly became a cult classic. The film was directed by David Schmaller, who Band had produced for in the past with Empire Pictures, on films like Taurus Trap. Many people assume the film was a direct ripoff of Child's Play, which came out only a year prior. However, there are more similarities between the aforementioned Empire film Dolls. The plot is surprisingly complicated. Before watching, I assumed the basic premise is that the puppets will get cursed in some way and come to life and go on a murderous rampage. However, there's more to the story than this. In 1939, a puppeteer named Andre Toulon is being tracked by Nazis who know about his hidden ability to bring puppets to life. Before it can be found, he hides his puppets and takes his own life. Fifty years later, a group of psychics have ominous visions about their old colleague Neil Gallagher and set out to check on him, to discover him dead. Turns out, he had discovered Toulon's secret, and the puppets seek to protect their master. If this sounds like a complicated and dense plot for a direct-to-video B-movie, well, it is. But this would serve the film well, as Puppet Master would become the foundation for Full Moon, becoming its most profitable and recognizable franchise. Puppet Master would end up spawning an entire franchise that expands the story of Toulon and the individual puppets. By all accounts, Puppet Master is not a great movie. It's not a daring movie or really even an exciting piece of cinema. However, there's much to appreciate about this cheese. The practical puppetry is impressive and makes the scary scenes a bit more visceral than a CGI monster or something like that. This is a passion of Band, as he's gone on record to say that while in many cases CGI may have been cheaper, he prefers the look and effort of practical effects, which I can appreciate. The characters have unique and interesting designs, each with their own specific way to kill their victims. Besides character design, there was clearly a care and consideration put into other elements of the film, such as the cinematography by Italian cinematographer Sergio Savalti. The lighting effects and shot composition aren't actually that bad, and the editing goes a long way to help bring the puppets to life. While Puppet Master has numerous issues with its acting, its writing, its plot, the core filmmaking tenets are still there. And if you compare it to other directed video films of the time, you can really see where the cast and crew's experience in the film industry Industry, helped to make the film become the cult classic that it became. Puppet Master would not be it for Full Moon. In fact, quite the contrary. The success of Puppet Master proved that Band was right. There was space for horror and sci-fi themed budget flicks in the directed video market. And with a clear formula for success, Band set out to begin his B-movie Empire. See, now the Empire joke makes sense. My name is Charlie Band, and I hope you've enjoyed our film. So, now we get to the fun part. Let's talk about some of the movies that are a part of this empire. It goes without saying that we couldn't possibly cover every movie here, but what I'd like to do is point out some significant titles and moments in the Full Moon catalog, and try to paint a picture of the types of movies that Full Moon went on to make. One thing I will say is that, while a lot of Full Moon films are straight up awful, I do need to commend Charles Band for not only his perseverance and grit, as previously mentioned, but for his creativity and maintaining some semblance of creative control over Full Moon. As he states here, he is still coming up with ideas for Full Moon films. That doesn't mean that every idea is great, but I have to respect him for sticking to his word and not letting Full Moon become another Empire Pictures situation. All that being said, let's talk about some of this garbage. And I say garbage with all due respect. 
So as mentioned, Puppet Master has become a very dense and movie-ridden franchise. To date, there are 15 Puppet Master movies, as well as merchandising galore with comic books, toys, trading cards, and even a video game. The franchise now has 26 puppets, some of which being reimagined versions of the originals. A trend we start to see in pretty much all B-movies is that the switch to digital instead of film fundamentally changes the quality and feel of B-movies. Now, with less budget constraints and the ability to simply delete and restart and edit freely, much less care needs to be given to the filmmaking process. This change feels very clear to me specifically when it comes to Puppet Master, due to the fact that the switch to digital happened in the middle of the franchise's existence, creating a marked difference between early entries into the franchise and later ones. However, the switch to film wouldn't be the only difference. In 1991, Puppet Master 3 Two Lines Revenge would release and change the whole atmosphere of the Puppet Master franchise. Contrary to the original and its sequel, it would frame the puppets as protagonists. While the two films would show the puppets as clear antagonists as they murder and kill anyone in their paths, the third would have the puppets face off against the most evil group of all, even more evil than murder crazed puppets, Nazis. While the movies are more or less just lighthearted slasher type movies, I do find the incorporation of Nazis to be an interesting one. There's definitely a thematic element of showing these blood hungry puppets controlled by a power hungry master as an opposing force to Nazis. All of this to say, unless you're down for the long haul, if you're gonna check out this franchise and want some funny doll kills, it might be worth it to just stick to the first two movies. However, these movies go to places you wouldn't expect, and also retcon and change the lore a whole lot. So best not to go into them, get too caught up in the, you know, story. Full Moon will go on to create other franchises as well. However, none will catch on to the same extent as Puppet Master. While not exactly a notable franchise, Full Moon would find some more success in the early 90s by using a similar formula to Puppet Master. In 1992, Full Moon would release Demonic Toys. The plot was a lot easier to follow than Puppet Master, and it was clear that in many ways, the company was trying to replicate the success of the previous edition. And this replication worked a little bit. Demonic Toys would receive a sequel in 1993, Doll Man vs. Demonic Toys, in which another previously established Full Moon character, Doll Man, would face off against the evil toys. Then in 2004, in a similar vein, Puppet Master vs. Dynamic Toy... The... Dynamic? Then in 2004, in a similar vein, Puppet Master vs. Demonic Toys would release. Since then, there have been a plethora of sequels and spin-offs involving specific toys from the series, but it's clear that there wasn't really much for the toys to be doing besides squaring off with other more established Full Moon characters. While the lack of backstory made the films easier to follow and enjoy as a straight-up B-movie slasher, this is also where the series struggled to be anything more than that. It's worth noting that the same craftsmanship and thought put into the puppets from Puppet Master was clearly given to Demonic Toys as well, at least in the first few entries. We move next to Killjoy. The first Full Moon franchise in the new millennium will be the Killjoy movies, which follow a murdered man who seeks revenge by returning to Earth as a demonic clown named Killjoy. Despite the film's negative reception, I figured it was worth mentioning due to the fact that it spawned five sequels, with the last of the franchise coming out in 2019, almost two decades after the original. Something significant about the movies is they featured a predominantly black cast, and the first one had a black director. Of course, this wasn't the first Full Moon movie to have black characters in it, so it's nice to see Full Moon beginning to broaden its horizons during this time. That being said, the Killjoy movies never really hit a big, but if you're into that kind of thing, you might want to check them out. The mid-2000s throughout the 2010s would see something of a shift in Full Moon features. While the company did not shy away from taking chances on new ideas, this is also a time of the company finding what's stuck and, well, milking it. I would mark the beginning of this change as 2005, with the release of The Ginger Dead Man. Over the top and intriguing, the film would feature Gary Busey as a serial killer whose ashes are mixed in with gingerbread batter, reincarnating him as the Ginger Dead Man as he proceeds to wreak havoc in a bakery. The film is bad. I think that goes without saying at this point. However, there's an outside factor that we haven't been able to account for in our discussion, and you're using it right now. I think the success and reputation of Full Moon just happened to coalesce with the spread and ubiquity of the internet. YouTube went live in 2005, the same year that the film came out. And much like Charles Band was quick to see the space he could fill as a DIY filmmaker, he was also quick to see that the internet could be massively helpful in spreading brand awareness and helping smaller companies like his. So with the internet making sharing film opinions much more accessible, Full Moon was able to capitalize on this. The internet also helped to create a phenomenon appreciating underground films, 
where people could connect with others about any film they wanted. Regular people became critics online. While this was early, there was also a burgeoning internet and meme culture beginning to grow during this time. While joking about bad films had become a popular format with series like Mystery Science Theater 3000, films like The Room, which were released in 2003, had become such huge jokes online that there were entire communities of people looking for so bad it's good filmmaking. This is where I don't believe Charles Band gets enough credit. As much as a lot of his own ideas and thoughts and techniques to make these movies often aren't so great, that's also kind of the point. There's a certain self-awareness to his projects. I believe during this time period, Ban had his finger on the pulse of internet culture. He knew what would gain headlines and attention. He knew that a movie starring Gary Busey as a serial killer gingerbread man would get people talking. At that point, what happens in the movie is irrelevant. People are watching it just to see what it's even about. I think this attitude summarizes how Full Moon felt for the majority of the late 2000s into the 2010s. Ginger Dead Man would end up spawning multiple sequels and become a seminal work of the company, as well as another franchise which would come out in 2006. This summer, let's get baked. Evil Bomb. Dude, it's one scary trip. Evil Bong is about a bong that is evil. It was another way that Charles Bam was able to show some self-awareness in his projects. He knew a large portion of viewers of his films were stoners or people who were getting high and watching something that sounded insane based on the name and poster alone. In Evil Bong, the characters that use the bong get trapped in the bong world where killer strippers can kill them. You'll know this if you watch the movie because this is pretty much all that happens. This one didn't really do it for me. However, who am I to judge? Because clearly stoners or someone loved it, as Evil Bomb would become a staple series of Full Moon, with sequels such as Evil Bong 2, King Bong, Evil Bong 4, Bong 3D, Evil Bong 777, Evil Bong 888, and in classic Full Moon fashion, we would see Ginger Dead Man vs. Evil Bong. The stories of pretty much all Full Moon successful franchises are very similar once you begin to zoom out and look at the bigger picture. They release whatever they want with a funny and intriguing premise and hopes that it will stick. If it does, they franchise it, market it, make toys of it, and immediately pump out as many sequels as they can to keep it relevant. If it doesn't, it's on to the next project. While the results of this is often, unfortunately, simply rushed, poor quality films, I do have a respect for this kind of filmmaking. I think it's an outlook that bigger studios in Hollywood could learn a lesson from. The film industry as a whole has become so obsessed with recognizable IPs that many successful movies are either of recognizable IPs or trying to replicate them, or themselves trying to become a recognizable IP. Not enough chances are given on interesting ideas, and Hollywood finds itself squarely in the franchise and market the hell out of this phase. From a filmmaking perspective, Charles Band may not be a beacon of knowledge to take inspiration from, but his philosophies and ability to garner a dedicated fan base are definitely worth considering. That helps, and I think more than anything else, again, back to the analogy of making a bad horror film, which no one sets out to make, but even if it's not so good, uh, it's still marketable. Before we finish up, while we've discussed major Full Moon franchises, I'd like to point out some of their one-offs film for no other reason other than I think they're insane and I want to talk about them. I'm going to try to stick the ones that I don't see brought up a lot online. The first of these I want to talk about is Arcade from 1993. This is one of the only films where Full Moon would actually heavily rely on CGI, which makes sense given the boom of CGI at the time. It's about a virtual reality game where if you lose, your soul gets sucked into the game forever. What's noteworthy about this film is that there's a full, entirely different version that exists. However, it never really saw the light of day. When initial promotional material was being released, Walt Disney Company had allegedly threatened to sue them due to similarities between this film and Tron. There was not a lot of documentation about this whole ordeal, so this all might be conjecture. However, it seems like in some region, the original film with old CGI was released. Either way, an interesting bit of production history for this ultimately pretty forgettable movie. Next up is Head of the Family, which focuses on a family of mutants, each specializing in one specific element of a human. Notably, one with a giant head, who is the head of the family. Get it? I mostly wanted to mention this one simply because when I was a kid, that cover would haunt me for years. Ugh. I also wanted to mention Blood Dolls, not for the film itself, but for the circumstances outside of it. Don't get me wrong, the film has a very strange plot, in which a perverted billionaire who has his body experimented on as a child kidnaps an alt-rock all-girl group in a cage and keeps him in a basement to perform fantasies on, all while creating a murderous trio of dolls to get revenge on the people who've wronged him. However, what's even more interesting is the fact that a member of the cast, Penelope, Penelope Penelope Spheris made a documentary about the creation of this movie entitled Holly Weird. The only information I could really find on it was a mostly empty IMDb page with one review from 2008, so 
take this with a grain of salt. I was able to find that on the Full Moon Features website, they do have something called From the Vault, Holly Weird, but it seems to be the DVD extra, so it will remain as lost media for now, if it was ever complete to begin with. Now this one, this next one, I don't even know how to approach talking about. I'm gonna show you a clip from this trailer, and I'm gonna try to explain it so that way I don't get demonetized. No, you're innocent. Somehow I will bring justice to your name. <laughs> Devin? So, Uga Booga is about an African American man who's wrongfully murdered by a racist police officer. So he comes back to life in the form of a doll, because of course he does, because of course this is a full moon feature. A doll called Ooga Booga, who's just a walking racial tribal stereotype, and he uses his form to get revenge on the police officer. I don't even know what to say about this one. I do think they were trying to make some sort of statement about racial injustice, but I'm not exactly sure what it was. What do you think you're gonna do to me? Okay, the last movie I want to talk about kind of fits in this category, but it's also emblematic of what the final section of the video is about. So I'll begin the last section of the video and end this discussion all in one beat. Round zero of the virus. This was taken moments ago at the Wuhan China Soup Factory, where they were testing their newest flavor, bat soup. In 2020, Charles Band directed Corona Zombies, which is exactly what it sounds like. The film imagines a reality in which the pandemic was actually a zombie pandemic instead of a virus. The movie is actually very strange because it's a remix of an old zombie movie from 1980 called Hell of the Living Dead. It splices scenes of the pandemic in the original plot by Band with old zombie killing scenes from a 1980 film. It's very clear when the changes take place because the new footage makes no attempt to look like the old footage. Not only that, but the scenery doesn't usually line up, making it kind of confusing to follow. Overall, the film is just to be fodder, if I'm being frank. But this leads into a larger discussion about Charles Band filmmaking and how his philosophy holds up today. I mentioned earlier in this video about how in the 2000s, Full Moon seemed to purposely entice audiences with outlandish premises, titles, posters, and to a large extent, nothing has changed in that regard. It's clear to see why these movies gained a kind of following, where the newer ones just haven't been able to capture that audience. Films like Ginger Dead Man and Evil Bong were introducing original characters, some recognizable actors, had a clear dedication for practical effects, puppets, and prop building. We fast forward to 2020 to see Corona Zombies, and we see how different this is. The company is still using outlandish ideals and shock value to entice viewers, but without any original or creative ideas. It's at the expense of a global pandemic. Instead of new creatures to market and sell, a lot of the movie is spliced from an older movie that Band himself didn't even make. When we begin to look at other movies that come out since 2020, we see a bit of a trend. We see Full Moon attempting to capitalize on recognizable IPs again. Don't get me wrong, there are definitely a plethora of new one-off movies with original ideas. However, among these are sequels and prequels to Puppet Master and Demonic Toys and Evil Bong. The one-offs we do get are a similar caliber of quality to Corona Zombies, and the newer films aren't retaining the same kind of audience. Instead of employing new ideas and trying to push the boundaries of B-movies like Band had done for years, Full Moon is wringing a cloth that's already dry. But the sad reality is, as I just alluded to, the only films that get people talking online are the ones that use their own recognizable IPs from the last 30 years. Sound familiar? This is not meant to be an attack on Full Moon features. Believe me, that's not my intent. For the amount of insults and criticisms I've thrown their way, I really do have a soft spot in my heart for them. A spot that went empty, only a full moon movie can fill. I'm using them as an example to outline how dire of a situation the film industry as a whole is in. Charles Band made his whole career off of finding Hollywood's weak points and exploiting them. By recognizing low budget movies could still be creative and fun. By throwing a billion creative ideas to the wall and seeing what stuck. But now, we as a society have done filmmakers like him wrong. Now the only way they can get someone to watch their movies is by pasting Blade or Evil Bong's face on it. If a company like Full Moon has to rely on their already established, oversaturated market of franchises, where does that leave the rest of Hollywood? I should clarify here. I'm not trying to say that Full Moon is a pinnacle of creativity and originality for years and now they're not. Let's be real here. They've been overusing and repackaging their recognizable characters for a long time. But in the early 2000s when they were milking Puppet Master, for example, they were also establishing new characters and new franchises. With all due respect for the company, all we have left now in terms of characters to fill that void is Baby Oopsie and the Barbie and Kendra series. 
whatever that is. However, the double-edged sword about this whole conversation is that, to be blunt, it's hard to talk about the quote-unquote downfall of a production company when the whole point of them is that they were never really that good in the first place. Is there really a huge difference between Full Moon's output now and what they were doing in the 90s through to the 2010s? Well, clearly I think so. I truly do think that the transition from film to digital, as well as using less practical effects and reusing tired ideas, have a big change in the kind of films that they make. But in reality, at the time that these movies came out in the 90s, they were put in a similar category as today. They were always seen as the low-budget, shock-value company, following trends in horror and sci-fi, and capitalizing on them as fast as they could. They were always the underdogs, but that's how they thrived. That's how they carved out a name for themselves. How Band created an empire of hundreds of movies that his company has produced. So maybe it's just a matter of context. Full Moon has an extensive catalog of movies. They've created limited series, podcasts, documentaries, and even host a streaming service where you can see all their stuff online. They have a dedicated fan base, they've successfully marketed characters, and have a reputation in the film business for making the best worst horror movies you've ever seen. Even if you haven't seen any of their movies or never plan to, it's hard not to be impressed at a catalog and production company that quite literally rose from the ashes of another. And above all, despite all its flaws, it's hard not to recognize and appreciate the creative force behind it all for taking often small budgets and restraints of film Filming and trying to make something special out of it, inspiring independent filmmakers for decades. Now my advice is jump in. You know, uh, I've heard so much advice, and I think some of so much of it is such bogus advice. You know, you you just have to start doing it. There's no other way to really learn. You know, you can go to school for 10 years and understand technique and look at all the classics, but you know, five days on a low-budget movie set will teach you more than all of that. So yeah, that's pretty much all I had to say. I'm leaving a lot out of the story of Full Moon. There's just a lot to cover. Part of this is because Band is very willing to talk about this, so you can go watch him talk about it. He's done countless interviews outlining his creative process, stories of filmmaking behind the scenes, and sometimes for podcasts and productions as small as mine. Sometimes even smaller. I think what I respect about him most is that he clearly has a passion for his craft. He wants to inspire others to follow their passions as well. There's a lot to read about Full Moon and their history, and this is just scratching the surface. The purpose of this video is not to act as a comprehensive review of everything Thing they've ever done, but I wanted to introduce the company for people who maybe hadn't heard of them before, as well as offer some thoughts about them for fans in 2024. So thanks for sticking around if you did. To end this video on a more positive and broad note, I guess the great thing about films is that they're timeless. They exist outside of the people or companies that make them. If you don't like Full Moon features today and their new movies, just don't watch them. Just focus on the older ones that you watched with friends and cried laughing, or the ones that scared you as a kid, or the ones that you just needed to watch out of morbid curiosity. There's a lot to enjoy about films and media as a whole if you allow yourself to have fun and don't take yourself too seriously. Thanks for listening, and take it easy.